Well, good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Were any of you panicked and a little bit worried that you'd have to get up and shake hands with somebody during this coronavirus situation? You know, I did hear this week that it had mutated. They said that if you get it twice, it's now called the Dos Equis virus. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's kind of a virus slash beer joke. I didn't know if it set well with all you super holy people, but you know, we're good. We're good, right? Listen, if you are here today and this is your first time, I just want to first say thank you very much for coming and joining us today. We are here at this church, man. We just want to get into God's presence and allow for his presence to change us. That's what we're all about here at this church. Our vision of this church is to have life-changing encounters with the presence of God. That's why we do worship the way that we do worship. That's why we deal with the kids the way that we deal with the kids, which is to allow for them to step into God's presence. We worship with them. We get them into small groups so that they can talk with their, with their leaders. We do so many things here at this church to engage with God's presence. And so I'm just excited today to do the same thing in this message. I'm just really sitting in this message and been thinking about it a lot this week. And I just wanted to really kind of set up what we're doing over the next few weeks. So if you have your phones, uh, go ahead and get those out. You want to make sure that you're following us at New River Fellowship. Make sure you connect with us there. Make sure that you have our app. If you want to follow along with some of the notes, you're going to see some of those things in the app if you want to keep track of that. If you want a Bible, if you don't have one, we have some in the back of the room so that you can have a, a Bible with you. I always like to have mine available. When I'm walking around praying, I usually just hold it. Sometimes I don't even open it. I just got to hold it. You know, in Scripture, it refers to the Word of God as our sword. You just never know when the enemy comes out. You just got to get after him a little. So I always just keep it with me. I love having my Bible. So we are in a series. This is week two of our series, Vital Signs, and we're talking about healthy relationships. Last week, we started first with a healthy you, and we started there because I know and you know that if you're not healthy, if you're not ready for relationships, you're going to have a hard time in relationships. We all know that relationships are difficult. Am I right? Wow, that was the weakest amen I've heard in a while. Uh, yes, relationships are very difficult. They're hard. Why? Because relationships involve people. People are hard. Like, y'all are hard. I'm difficult. We're all hard to work with and get along with each other. Let's just get that out of the way. We have problems, and we carry those problems into relationships. You want to have the healthiest, the most vibrant relationships? That means you need to get into God's presence and experience freedom. Because the more free that you are, the more free your relationships will be. So today, I want to cover a topic that I don't honestly hear a lot in churches. And this is a healthy friendship. I don't know if you've ever been to a church and heard the service on healthy friendship, but I was like, hey, I'll just do one on healthy friendships. And I was thinking, I don't know if I've ever actually heard a message on friendships. So I started to dig in and just really soak up what God has to say about healthy friendships. How many of you have ever had one of those really good friends, like your best friend, you've always had somebody in your life? Yeah, how many of you just wish you had a best friend that was always there for you? We, I mean, we all want that closeness. We all want that friendship, that person that's with us and walks with us, the person that knows all your secrets, the person that knows all your junk. And you're like, nobody else has to know because they know it. And they're a vault. They're going to keep it special and secret. And guess what? They still love you in spite of all that stuff. That's the best part, right? When somebody knows all your stuff and they still love you, you're like, there is hope for me yet. You know, it's because for some reason, the enemy wants to keep us trapped up and bottled up and afraid to tell our story, afraid to tell all the, the things that have hurt us. And, and it's not a matter of you just have to get in front of everybody and tell them, but man, we need healthy friendships, healthy relationships that we can tell our story to. Be like, man, I know I'm saved, but I did not act like it this week. Can you pray for me? Let's pray together. I need to change. Can you help me? I love it because in scripture, man, there's this verse that sticks out for everybody. It's known as the golden rule, and you can find it in Luke 6, 31. Everybody knows the verse, do to others as you'd have them do to you. This is a verse we find in scripture. This is how a lot of relationships really start. When you start thinking of friendships, when we teach our kids, we teach them this rule all the time. Hey, treat somebody the way that you want to be treated. The Passion Translation says it like this. However you wish to be treated by others is how you should treat everyone else. That's beautiful. That's a simple verse right there that gets us started into friendships. And, and I started to realize friendships are awesome. There's one particular woman. She had a friend, and she said, I was the worst for nine months when I was pregnant. And my friend would call me every other day, and she said, I'm calling to talk to you just in case no one else will. 
There's another woman, she had a, a birthday every single year, because that's what happens when you have birthdays, and her friend would bake her a cake every year. She said, my best, best friend makes me a cake every year because everyone needs a homemade cake for their birthday. This is what friends do. There was another friend, she says, every time I'm having a rough day, my friend shows up at my house and says, give me your kids, you need to relax. And she shows up, she doesn't call. She knows if, I, if she calls, I'll try to tell her not to come. She just shows up. Those are the kinds of people that we want in our life. The one that will just show up when we're having a bad day. The one that makes you a cake when everything is just frustrated. Whatever that cake may be for you. That may be taking you out into the woods and just go hunting. It could be going fishing. It could be making a quilt. It, it, whatever it may be, sometimes you just need somebody to just show up in your life. I remember when I was a youth pastor a long time ago, uh, my pastor at that time, there was a kid that had gone to the hospital, and it was about an hour away, and he came to me and he says, listen, if you'll go and show up at that hospital today with that kid, you'll be in their family for the rest of your life. And I was like, let's just see. So I show up at this kid's hospital visit, and sure enough, I become a family member for the rest of my life with this family, because why? I just showed up, because that's what friends do. You show up, and all of a sudden, you became family. So today, as we're walking through the text, as we're walking through scripture, we're going to look at a healthy friendship. We're going to look at what is unhealthy friendships, how to, how to navigate that. And we're going to look at what God has to say about his friendship with us. So let's just take a second. Let's just pray. So Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for everyone that's here that remembered to roll that clock forward. So God, we just pray for the next service to be nice and full of all the people who were late to the first service. And it's okay. We forgive them, Jesus. And so God, we just ask today that you would really unpack for us what your word has to say and allow for us to be changed by your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start out with just a fun scenario. I want to give you five kinds of people. Now, rem remember, keep eye contact with me because if at any time I say somebody and you look over at your spouse or your friend, they may think we're talking about them. The goal is to really look at yourself today, okay? We want to look at ourselves and say, do I have any kind of tendency that kind of aligns with these personalities? Now, yes, there will be crossover to your spouse and friends, but we're talking about you, okay? Okay. So the first person that we tend to look at is a person named All About Me Alice. I heard a, mm, okay, just don't look at anybody. Every conversation you have with Alice is about Alice. Alice can't stop talking about herself. And listen, I named these so that it didn't correlate to anybody that I know. If there's an Alice in here, it's not you, okay? So All About Me Alice is one of those people, every time you sit and have coffee with them, they don't ask about you. They just jump right into their story and they don't stop until you're done. That person just like, you, you sit down and be like, how's your day? That was the last thing you got to say. The next hour is spent just listening. Mm-hmm. 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 Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All about me, Alice. It's all about her. Do you know that the disciples even had a problem with this, though? We found in Luke 9, 46, that the disciples actually had an argument with each other about who was the greatest among the disciples. It was all about them. Jesus is walking with them, and they're trying to decide which one's the best. This is Alice. The second person is controlling Carl. This person wants to control how you feel, what you think, how you act. You must have the right reaction to their story or they're going to keep telling that story until they get the reaction out of you that they want. Y'all know some controlling Carls, don't you? This person tries to control things, even the things that they're not in control of. They're constantly just going around, and it's typically and especially emotional control. They want you to think and feel the way that they feel. Uh, Mooching Margo, this is the third one. Mooching Margo is a special person because they, last week we ended in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, and we talked about the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Mooching Margo wants to take all the fruit on your spiritual tree for themselves because usually their spiritual tree is barren. This is the kind of person that will come to you and just absorb everything that you've got. It's very similar to Alice, can even seem very similar to controlling Carl, but Mooching Margot's sole purpose is to soak up all of your goodness and just take it on for themselves. You don't hear from them very often. See, Alice wants to talk with you every day about every story she's got going on. But Mooching Margot wants to just only come in when she's just tired and exhausted. This is also what it sounds like. You ever walked up to somebody and said, how are you doing today? And every time Mooching Margo answers, she goes, Ugh, it's all right. And you're like, what she's doing now, or he, Margo can be a dude for this, okay? What they're doing now is they are trying to rob you of your joy. 
These people make constant friendship withdrawals, but never any deposits. Number four, drama Steve. He's even upset his name doesn't even rhyme with the rest of it. Steve is so upset. Every day is a brand new drama. Oh, it's just over the top. It's just, oh, can you, my grass isn't even growing right. Can you pray for me? It's like everything needs prayer request. Every time there's a prayer meeting, they got, oh, everything is, oh, my dog died three years ago, and I'm just still reliving the pain. I mean, everything is so dramatic. He'll make up anything and everything. No one understands me. No one cares about me. Everybody's out to get me. It, this is the person that everything, everything is so dramatic. The fifth one. Now, listen, if some of y'all are wondering if I'm a little bit drama, Steve, it's fine. Sometimes I have tendencies. It's okay. Everybody's got to clean up their own heart. You know what I'm saying? Number five, jealous gene. These people are never happy with themselves, and they belittle others to feel better. It'll sound like this. Did you know that Steve bought a new boat? Can't, bet he can't even pay his bills. Gene loves to talk bad about Alice and that new house she keeps talking about. So you know what Gene does? Gene goes and tries to pull out all the money they got to try to keep up with the Joneses. They can never, this person can never celebrate a win with you because they're too jealous of your victory. These are those people you, want, you run to and you're all excited about something and you're just like, did they just get depressed that I have something to celebrate? This is jealous Gene. They can never be happy for you. These are the five kinds of people that I would classify that sometimes people take on tendencies and you just have a little flare-up, so you got to watch out for yourself. How, man, did I just control that conversation? I've had conversations with people, you may not believe me, where I talked the whole time. I sat down, <laughs> listen now. <laughs> Some of y'all laughed a little too long. It happens. You have to be very conscious of how you are living your life with your friendships. If you're wondering, like, man, why am I having such a hard time in friendships? Just take a look at some of this and go, like, maybe I'm not celebrating wins with my friends. Maybe I'm talking too much about myself. Maybe I'm not asking them, hey, how are you doing? There is a real thing in this world where you can make a withdrawal into some, out of somebody's life or you can make a deposit. It's very much like the bank. At the bank, you can go and you can put money in the bank so that when you're ready to make a withdrawal from the bank and when you need to go purchase something or get something done, because you've made a deposit, there is money in the bank. Friendships are a lot like an emotional deposit and an emotional withdrawal. You know it because you've had those relationships where people make emotional withdrawals constantly and you go, I got nothing left for you. You feel it. It's constant. And you're like, I, you get frustrated with them. You get mad with them. And it's okay to then develop a healthy boundary for that person. Go like, hey, maybe we just should be acquaintances. Maybe I should see you less and less. Maybe I've got to guard my heart to make sure that I'm not getting upset and mad at you because you've been making a lot of withdrawals and there's not a lot in the tank right now. So what I want to do is I want to look at a story in Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, get them out. We're going to be in 1 Samuel, and we're going to be in verse 18. And I'm going to have to give you some backstory. I thought I could read three or four chapters out of 1 Samuel, but y'all might get tired of just hearing me read for a while. So I'm going to hit some verses as we're going through the story of Jonathan and David. And I'm going to set up a little bit for you here as you go there. You got to see in 1 Samuel, we see a friendship starts to develop with Jonathan and David. And we're going to look at that. But to give you some context as to what's going on, you have to kind of go back a few more verses and realize that David, and many of you know that David later became the king of Israel. Well, at this time, in this particular text, Saul was king of Israel and David was a young man. Samuel, the prophet, anoints David as a young man to be the future king of Israel. Saul doesn't really know this necessarily. But Saul begins to see something in David and begins to bring him around because one of his uh, people in his court, during Saul's time, he'd get really frustrated, he'd get headaches, and they said, hey, why don't we find someone who can help with this? So they bring in David, who played on the harp, and I love that he was a worshiper and a warrior. And he comes in, and he's there in the court, and he's caring for Saul, and he's, he goes back and forth between his home and the king's court. And during this time of just being an acquaintance with Saul and hanging out, Saul's son Jonathan was the prince of Israel. So David comes and he's working. He's a musician, a worshiper. David becomes an armor bearer eventually for Saul. And here's the fun part that everybody remembers is that David defeats Goliath right before chapter 18. This is the part where as David's kind of working for Saul and going back home and tending the sheep and coming back and working for Saul and going to tend his sheep as he's growing up as a young man, this is where the Philistines come and attack Israel. And this is where the great setup happens 
where David goes to the front line of the battle and he sees Goliath shouting out at Israel. And in this battle, David, the future king of Israel, defeats Goliath. And really at that moment, it solidifies his relationship in the household of Saul, where Jonathan, who is his son is, is living. So what I want to do is I want to walk through this process, and we're going to look at the story. But before we do, the first thing is this. I need you to understand as we're talking about friendship, that friendship is a gift from God. Friendship is a gift from God. We know this because in the scriptures, you'll see these one another's. There's these commands that is a one another command. It's, it's seen 58 times to help one another, to serve one another, to love one another, care for one another, encourage one another. God designed us to be with one another. And friendships are a vital part of that relationship. These are what relational deposits really look like to love and encourage and to care. Matter of fact, in Proverbs 13, 20, you see it says, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. And there's two parts to this verse that I look at where it says to walk with and to have companions. And we are designed by God to be in relationship with each other, to be in friendship with each other. And so now as we get into the story, I want you to see how God has aligned and brought Jonathan and David together. So let's look at this 1 Samuel 18 verses 1 through 4. It says this, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Do you know that a friend loves you as themselves? We talked about that last week. It says you should love your neighbor as yourself. Man, that's how friendship really is. When a friend can love you, man, they love you as themselves. Man, they give of themselves. They are there. And so you see Jonathan using that same language, that he loved David as himself. We saw that last week in Mark chapter 12, verse 31. And I love it because Jonathan begins to see something in David. David had been in this court for a while. He'd been kind of an acquaintance, and they'd seen each other around. He's working for his dad, Saul. And, and so Jonathan looks at David, and he begins to see something in David that he loves and is like, oh, this guy's kind of cool. You know, I like this guy. And sure enough, how awesome would it have been to watch David take on Goliath? I was reading this story, and it talks about, like, he's, he's kind of verbal sparring with Goliath, you know, like, Goliath is challenging him. David just gives one back. I'm like, this guy is massive. And you got this little kid over here who's just kind of running around in his shorts and a t-shirt with a sling. And is like, it says that David ran to the front of the battle line. After your argument with somebody, that's, that's pretty brave. And you got to imagine Jonathan is watching David go in and fight and watch this whole thing happen. And you're like, that guy's cool. I like that guy. So he becomes friends with him right after this. And you see it. It says, right after Jonathan recognized David. And it says that he, he loved him as himself. He became one in spirit with him. In other words, man, I see something. We have something in common, man. I'm ready to fight. You learn later that Jonathan was a little bit of a wild hair himself. He did the same thing. He'd go after and fight armies, man. And so these guys began to really develop a friendship. And that is so beautiful because we need that. Proverbs 18, 24 says that a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And that's what Jonathan, this whole time, he probably was just kind of companions, had some people around. He just knew some people who were hanging out in the courts. But eventually he found David. And Jonathan and David, man, they loved each other as themselves and just gave to each other and were there for each other. And that's really what sets up this third point, which is that a good friend is good to you. What's funny is that we remind kids in school this all the time. I have to tell my kids all the time, if they're not good for you, they're not good for you. They're not your friend. If they're talking bad about you, they're not your friend. They're not a good friend if they're talking bad about you. That's not good. But we have to train our kids to find and to see that's not a healthy relationship. That's not a friend. That might just be an acquaintance. Don't hang out with them. Don't sit next to them at lunchtime. See, a friend doesn't talk bad about you. A friend doesn't make up stories about you. A friend doesn't let people lie about you. A friend doesn't use you to get what they want. This is not what friendship is. And we teach our kids from an early age in elementary 
That's, they're not your friend. Your kids get in trouble at school and be like, why did you do that? Well, so-and-so said it'd be funny if I stood up and said this in front of the whole class. That's not a friend. Don't do that. Everybody knows this. If they jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? I've heard that so many times. Because if your friend jumps off the if your friend jumps off a bridge, that's probably not your friend. Don't chase him. Don't do that. My friend Dustin, I grew up with a friend of mine, Dustin, here in Weatherford. He's a really good friend of mine. And you know a good friend because when you get older and you start to hear the stories they tell about you, it makes you sound even better than you're pretty sure it was. I'm like, tell him another story, man. That sounds good. You make me sound so much better, so much cooler than I was. I think back and be like, man, I was a nerd. Nobody wanted to hang out with me. But every time he tells a story about me, you just think, that's a good friend. You tell all the stories you want, just not the few that I told you not to tell anybody. You see, we see Jonathan here being a good friend. Jonathan gives David his robe, his tunic, his sword, his bow, his belt. You got to imagine in this moment, the prince of all of Israel sees the greatness in David. Remember, David was anointed to be the future king. He didn't go around telling people, but they could see it. When the presence of God followed David into the courts and he would play his harp and begin to worship, the torment that Saul was under would flee. Why? Because the presence of God would follow David in his worship. And a good friend, man, a good friend sees that. Jonathan sees that in David and is like, you're a worshiper, man. I see you the way that you pursue God. I saw you the day that you were out there yelling at that giant Oh, man, and then you took off, and you did that sling thing, and you hit him around the head, and he fell down, and you took his sword, and you cut off his head. It was like the coolest moment I've ever seen in my life. And so there's this connection and this bond that just begins to grow between, between these two guys. And, and, and in the midst of this, it says in the scriptures that Jonathan pulls off his princely robe and puts it on David. He takes his tunic and his sword, all of the things that identified him as the prince of Israel, and he puts it on David. It's like this prophetic moment of like, this is the future king. I was supposed to be the future king, but I'm putting it all on this man right here, my friend David. Did everybody see what he did? This should be the future king. That is the level in which it really was. It wasn't like, hey, man, you want to borrow a shirt? No, he literally took off the robe off of his body and his tunic and everything. He just... he derobed himself to put it on David in this moment. And everyone got to see. Jonathan clothes David out of friendship. And the crazy thing is, this isn't the first time in Scripture we've seen somebody try to give David some clothes. Look at 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, verses 32, 39. I'm going to read it to you. Verse 32 says, David said to Saul, this is Jonathan's dad, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant would go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Can I, can I just take a pause for just a second? Some of you have had some battles in your life. Some of you have had a couple of fights in your life, and you may be looking at a current one that looks bigger than anything you've seen, but can I tell you, the faithfulness of God carries over. doesn't matter how big an enemy standing in front of you. You can look back on the testimony of your past and go, if he did it then, I don't care how big it is in front of me, I can stand up against that too. He said the paw of the bear, the paw of the lion, it's just it's going to be what's going to happen to his hand. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then, in verse 38, you got to pay attention to this. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. 
David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Can you imagine in this moment? Jonathan had tried to clothe David. He clothed him in a friendship. Saul turns around and tries to clothe him out of fear. Saul, looking at an enemy across the battle lines and sees a Goliath that he is not willing to go fight himself, he looks at a young man and goes, let me clothe you with all of my fear, and now you go fight him for me. Because when you, if you win, I want to make sure that everybody sees my armor getting the victory. Instead, Jonathan says, no, no, no. The future of this kingdom, I'm putting it on your shoulders. I'm your friend. I'm good to you. You take it. One comes in a friendship, comes in low, and clothes him. And guess what? David accepts it. He doesn't say like, no, man, this isn't mine. I shouldn't wear this. He says, thank you. We're brothers. We're friends. Jonathan clothed from a place of friendship while Saul was out of a place of fear. How many times does that happen in relationships with us? A good friend does not let you fight alone. That's what Saul did. Yeah, here's my sword, man. Go have at it. We find that Jonathan and David, man, were willing to fight together. When we give selflessly, we love generously. And that's what you saw in this relationship with Jonathan and David, is a selfless love of generosity. But Saul, out of complete fear, out of selfishness, I hope we get the win so I don't have to do anything. True friendships have a way of redeeming many things in our lives. Jonathan, in a selfless act of generosity, redeemed for David a previous relationship he had with Saul. Just remember the story of Saul. There are many times that Saul hurled the spear at David in anger and in frustration. You ever been in a friendship where there was a Carl or a Margo or an Alice who hurled the spear at you? I want you to know that God wants to provide a healthy and redeeming relationship for you. These are what they look like. See, Saul tried to make David into something he wasn't for his personal gain, but Jonathan comes and clothes him out of love and sacrifice and real friendship. But the enemy comes and does that for us, doesn't he? He tries to get you to wear your own dominion, your own kingdom. He tries to get you to step away from what God wants to clothe you in. You see, this is a story that even parallels how Jesus is a friend to us. Jesus gave up everything to make us what? Heirs to the throne. That sounds a lot like Jonathan and David. Jesus says to clothe yourself, what? In my righteousness, not your righteousness. Isaiah 61.10 says this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. Isn't it really awesome how Jesus is our friend? How he takes off his robe and puts it on us. He gives us his word as a sword, as a light. Romans 13, 14, that says, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, we put on Jesus. We get to walk in his righteousness, in his love, in his everything, and what he is. He brought us into his kingdom by putting on us his robe. It goes even farther because in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it goes on and says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So he took on our dirty, nasty, sinful clothes so that we could have his. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God because in our righteousness we are nothing. And he took that from us and gave us his righteousness. Jesus even goes on in John 15, 15 to call his friends. He's like, you're no longer a servant. You're my friend. We get to see in Scripture how Jesus himself is our friend. So if today you're sitting here thinking, man, I wish I had a friend like Jonathan. Man, I wish I had somebody in my life. I'm telling you right now, if you will give your life to him, Jesus will be the best friend you'll ever have. He'll speak words of kindness to you, of goodness to you. He takes off all of the sin and the shame and the baggage that we walk around in. And as a good friend, he steps in and he does exactly what Jonathan did. And he says, you become an heir to my kingdom, put on my righteousness. Oh, that is a much better place to be in. Jesus is the perfect example of the best friendship you could ever have. But how often have we taken the friendship of Saul? 
We do it because we like the status. We do it because maybe we wish we were like them. I I wish I could have a title like that. You want into the popular crowd. Maybe you just want a little closer to the top of the food chain. Maybe it's because you don't feel worthy of a real relationship. And so you continue to walk around in Saul's robe. Unwilling to walk away and see that, man, God has a Jonathan for you. For every one of you. Saul, he embodied all of the toxic relationships I talked about earlier. It was always about him. It was his robe. It was his battle. I remember in the story, you see, as they're coming back from defeating the Philistines, people began to sing songs of David and Saul. Except in the song, David killed a few more people than Saul, and it made him mad. I'm the king. You serve me. It's not a friendship. He wanted to control David. He wanted the victory won by David to be his. He needed David so that he could make him feel better. He'd say things like, come play for me so I feel better. Always making withdrawals from that relationship. Saul tried to kill David many times and talked about it openly. Saul, was the, um, Saul saw the anointing in David and he hated him for it. Sometimes it's hard to pursue Jesus. Sometimes it's really hard to look at your friends around you. When they see something different in you, man, they back up. I don't know what is that on you right now. You're acting different. You're talking different. Maybe you've been anointed and you've been walking around in the robes of Jesus in his righteousness, and it's unfamiliar to your current situation and your current friends. Don't take off that robe. Don't take off that righteousness to try to blend in with this crowd over here because what you're doing is you're taking on something unfamiliar the same as it was with David and Saul. Don't put on the unfamiliar robe. Step into the robe that was made and tailored for you in his righteousness, in his image. But we accept friendships all the time and we just completely get just worn down over and over and over. Why? Because we're walking around in something that doesn't fit us. You weren't designed to be in a relationship like that. That's not what a good friend does. But sometimes we do this, what? No, no, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hang in there. It's gonna get better. I'm gonna hang in there. It's gonna get better. No, sometimes the Lord wants you to back up and just take on his righteousness for a while, solidify in your own heart who you are in Christ so you can look across the table and then when they start saying something negative, you'll be like, hang on. I know you want to talk about yourself today, Alice, but can I just chime in for one minute and remind you of who you are? Can I tell you, you might be walking around in somebody else's robe, somebody else's shame, maybe your own shame, maybe your own guilt. Maybe you've been walking around in something that you should have taken off and stepped into a real friendship with Jesus. Because when you step into that kind of relationship, you'll know what kind of relationship to have with other people. Do what David did. He didn't accept it. No, this isn't me. I can't doesn't mean he went out of relationship with Saul. He just didn't accept his robe. He was himself. He picked up his sling, went and fought. And, and Jonathan saw the whole thing and loved him for it. He didn't remove himself from all the relationship, but he understood that Saul was not a healthy relationship. Listen, when people are throwing spears at you, it's not a healthy relationship. It's a bad idea. But here's the last part I need you to understand. Is that friends... Help you grow closer to God. That is a friend. That's what Jesus does for us, man. He is our mediator. He is the one that when the enemy wants to chime in and say things about us, just that little chirping spirit always wanting to tell you about your past. Jesus goes, that's not who you are. I already blotted that out. I don't even know what he's talking about anymore. There is no more shame. There's no guilt. Why? Because you're mine and I am yours. But the enemy loves to send a Saul to us before we ever encounter a Jonathan, doesn't he? But man, how we, we look at Jonathan's and think, man, I wish I, I, just, I wish I knew someone who would call out the good in me. I wish someone would encourage me to hang in there during those hard days at work. 
I wish I had a friend like a brother because I just, I can't get to, I can't see my own family very often. You ever moved away from your family? And man, you get that good friend and they're just as much family as the blood relatives you have back home. Romans 1 verse 12 says that it's talking about how friendships come together so that we can be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. We want to be encouraged by each other's faith. And we want to sit down over coffee and not talk about what's going on here and there, the coronavirus and, and the dog did this and that. No, we want to talk about the goodness of Jesus. And I got a lot to talk about when you start talking about Jesus. When you start talking about the, all, all the words that he's encouraged you with, all the words of encouragement for your friend, all those hard times that showed up, man, I want to love on you for a while. This is what a friendship should be. We encourage each other through our own faith. Together is really the key. We have to do it together. How do you defeat the enemy? It says in Revelation, by the blood of the lamb, that's already been taken care of, and by the word of our testimony, that means you have to tell it to somebody. That means you do it together. You sit down with somebody and tell them your story. And I have overcome because of this. And that might be the very word that just brings another friend to your table. First Samuel, as I'm kind of wrapping up here, if they want to come out and play on the keys. First Samuel 19, verses 1 through 4. It's one chapter later. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great, a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I'll go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king do this wrong to his servant David. You've got to completely understand what this really meant for Jonathan to speak up to the king. It was his father, but man, you don't talk to the king like that. When the king says, we're going to kill David, you just obeyed, but no, there was a friend who was closer than a brother who spoke up to the king and said, don't do this to him. And I love the words. He says that he warned him and he says, go out and stand. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to stand with my dad in the field where you are. He puts himself in harm's way for the sake of his friend. And the claim to his throne, he could have let David been killed. And they're like, well, you know, maybe this works out pretty good because I would like to be the king of Israel. But instead, he allows for David to be warned over and over and over again. He speaks up and speaks out to his own dad, to his own king, at risk of even being hurt himself. Because here's what a good friend is. A friend will believe the best about you. A friend will speak the best about you. And a friend will give the best to you. This morning, I think that sometimes we have to grieve broken friendships. Sometimes you've taken on the armor of a Saul to try to be a friend with somebody and they just hurt you over and over and over again. And often we can look back and say, man, yeah, it was that one. It was that one. And we just try to just really rush past all of our hurts and our feelings. But man, you've got to understand, take off all of that. You don't have to walk in that stuff. Jesus wants to come and to speak encouragement and healing into your heart, into your mind. Those relationships may not have been what you thought they were. But you have to trust that just like Jonathan and David, God wants to redeem our past relationships. It's good for us to pray for deep and real relationships to come. Man, we should lean into the ones that we have. Really understanding the goal and the purpose of those deep friendships are meant to draw us closer to God. And that changes maybe the way that you see your best friends, those close friends, how you select the ones in the future, how you bring yourself into circles and just love on people. Your job is meant to just walk into a relationship with the robe of Jesus' righteousness and say, listen, I got a friend that we can just work together and encourage each other and love on each other with his righteousness. Man, why don't you come join me? Man, it's like the greatest evangelism is going to go out and find some good friends. 
and to share Jesus with them. Bring them into your buddy circle. Know that you have a close friend in Jesus. You are never alone. Some of you need to hear that this morning. That is the word that you came to church waiting to hear, is that you are not alone. You are never alone. Even when physically you look around you and there's no one else, the Spirit of God is in you. Holy Spirit is encouraging you like a friend every day. And he'll guide you to find the Jonathan that you need in your life. Just ask him. Just ask him. So let's just take a second this morning. We're going to pray. If you'll just close your eyes. And if our ministry team wants, they can move to the back of the room. So Father God, I thank you today that you are a good friend. Jesus, we just, again, just pour out our love on you and just just our appreciation and our devotion and say thank you for giving us your robe of righteousness and drawing us into a closer friendship with you. Holy Spirit, this morning as you've been drawing, there are a few here today that you've been drawing closer to you. I'm praying that right now they just feel that kindness and that goodness in their spirit and they say, I have to give my life to this good friend Jesus and do it this morning. They don't walk away without giving their life to you. There are people in this room today, God, I just, I know that we're here. There's many of us who have had hard friendships in the past. They may have been years ago, but they still have the wounds and the hurts that we've been unable to deal with. And so, God, I pray today that we would be able to look, God, and just watch your spirit move and bring healing into all of those places where our friendships have hurt and wounded. I just pray for healing right now in the room in our spirit, in our heart, those emotional places that have just been hurt deeply. God, where those words and those maybe those times that we've just said, like we're never going to love again, we're never going to bring in somebody like that again, you just can't have friends. God, we just break every word, curse, every vow that we have accepted based off of a broken friendship. And in Jesus' name, we call in healing and health. So Lord, today we ask that you would move swiftly and bring us into deeper relationship with those around us. And in Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen.